episode starts on Saturday, March 30th at Bellagio in the middle of a six buy-in downswing. I'm sure most of you have experienced downswings throughout your poker journey, and you know they're no fun. They're one of the least favorite parts of the game of poker, for most people anyway. But accepting that they are going to happen and that they really do have to happen in order for the game to be profitable and to be a good game is a hard thing to wrap your head around. So let's kind of get into some of the hands and see what's going on. We start with King Jack of Diamonds here in middle position and we see an early position player limp under the gun and another player in middle position put in the limp as well. I raise it up, I make it 15 to go and only the player in the under the gun position puts in the call. So we're gonna go heads up here to a flop. Now as the middle position limper is making his decision on whether or not to call, I'm thinking about what the under the gun player is limp calling with in early position. I think he's gonna have a lot of pocket pairs. I think he's gonna have a lot of broadways and he's probably gonna have some suited connector. So that is to say he's gonna have a pretty wide range of hands here in this spot. We see a flop come down of five, four, three with two clubs. Very wet, very dynamic board here. And I think this board is gonna be better for his limp calling range than it's going to be for my raising range. So when he decides to check, I just go ahead and check back and we see the jack of spades peel off on the turn. Now the under the gun player decides to start betting on this turn card and he is gonna have a lot of jack X in his range here that we are ahead of. So he's gonna have some queen jack, he's gonna have some jack 10. He could even have some hands like jack nine in his range. So when he bets 20, I go ahead and put in the call and we're off to a river. River is the seven of hearts bringing four to a straight on the board. Now the under the gun player bets 50. I'm thinking about what sixes does he have in his range here that he's limp calling under the gun. I think a hand like pocket sixes, seven six suited, six five suited, probably even eight six suited and nine six suited would be in his limp calling range. So I think calling this $50 bet on the river is just a mistake. I think we're often gonna be beat here by a straight. In this particular situation, we were beat by ace jack off suit. So he had one of those Broadway holdings that I assigned in his range that he limp called under the gun and he ends up taking this one down. Sometimes when we're on a downswing, we tell ourselves that we are running bad or we're playing and getting unlucky, but oftentimes it's just bad decisions and we're not really thinking about the opponent's range as clearly as we could. And that narrative is exactly what continues in this next hand. I continue to tell myself that we're running bad and we're getting unlucky when the reality is, is I'm making a lot of bad decisions and I'm not paying attention to the game as fully as I should be. Small mistakes add up over time, and the more you make these little errors, not paying attention to the important details in the game, the more you're going to lose and the more our opponents are going to win. One of the key concepts to always remember is that our opponents win when we make mistakes, and we win when our opponents make mistakes. So in this next one, when I look down at eight, seven of clubs, I think I have a pretty good playable hand when I see a player limp in in early position and another player limp in in middle position and then a raise, I decide to put in a three bet here and get aggressive with this hand. Now three betting a hand like eight seven suited is not bad in and of itself, especially considering that the player who originally raised has about 220 ish behind. But what I didn't pay attention to closely enough was that the player who limped in has a short stack. He's going to be limp calling with a lot of Broadway cards here. He's gonna have a lot of pairs here. So he puts in a call for less, and now it's back over to the player who originally raised in the hijack, and he puts in the call as well. So now we're gonna to go to a flop with a side pot, which is not the best scenario in this type of a situation. The player in the hijack who raised called this three bet is gonna have a lot of hands like king, queen suited, queen, jack suited, a lot of Broadway holdings, some pairs. So when the flop comes down eight, five, three with one club, giving us a pair and some backdoor equity. When the player checks, I think we have a clear range bet here and I make mistake number two and I decide to just check back here on the flop, which I think we should be betting here with 100% of our range in position. Thankfully, the poker gods show us a little bit of mercy here on this turn card when we see the four of clubs. It gives us a lot of equity on this turn. We can hit any eight for trips, we can hit any club for a flush, 
and we can hit our straight as well on the river with a six. So when the hijack checks for a second time, I think she's really defined her range here as a lot of pairs and over cards. And I think we've just got enough equity to try to bet and get value from those hands. And if we are indeed behind, we can catch up on a lot of river cards here. So I make it 45 to go and the hijack thinks it over for a little bit before deciding to go ahead and put in the fold. Leaves us heads up with the player in the low jack who was all in for less. I think he was in for 31 total here. Now I expect the low jack to show up with a lot of small pocket pairs and hands like king queen suited or ace jack suited, but he ends up showing up with pocket jacks. The river is a brick, so we completely miss and he ends up taking this one down. Now it just goes to show you the hands that I expected him to have in his range as a short stack are not necessarily the hands that he had. I would expect him to go all in with a hand like pocket jacks. I would even expect him to go all in with a hand like ace queen or ace jack there with a small stack because it logically would make sense to do that. But you can't really put yourself in your opponent's shoes and think they would play the hand the same way that you might play the hand. Now I'm not sure exactly why, but I started to feel tilted after that last hand. And I think it's a combination of all of the poor decision making and some of the run bad that I've experienced over the last few sessions, which leads me to this hand. I end up with pocket eights in the small blind. We see a limp from the hijack and a raise from the cutoff. The button folds and I decide to just call here, which I think is a huge, huge mistake. Cutoff is a friend of mine. Shout out to Rob. You've made the vlog again, Rob. Congratulations. And I know he's capable of having a wider range here in the cutoff, especially when he's trying to isolate a player who limped in the hijack, which is why I think not three betting pre-flop with a hand like pocket eights out of position is a mistake. We allow a wide, weaker range in to see a flop. And that flop is six, nine, nine with two clubs and one spade. Start things off with a check, the hijack checks, and Rob continues firing for $15 on this flop, and I again put in a call. The turn is the 10 of diamonds. Now, if I were properly assessing Rob's range here, Rob's gonna have a lot of nines in his range, a ton of nines. 10 nine, he's gonna have a hand like nine eight suited. He could even have hands like nine seven suited. So he's gonna have a lot of value here. So when I check and he bets 35 and I put in the call, once again, I am not making good decisions here. So it's very important to think about your opponent's range and to think about what hands they're taking certain actions with when you're in the moment and not let the fog of war get in the way. Now the river brings out another nine. It's the nine of diamonds. And I'm thinking, he's no way he can have a nine here. Now we've got him beat, we've got a full house, we're good. Nothing to worry about, right? Well, maybe not, because he can still have all the big pocket pairs, pocket jacks, pocket queens, pocket kings. He could even have tens full here in this spot. So when I check and he bets for $120, I really need to think about his range. And instead, I just end up snap calling here, which is a huge, huge mistake. And that leads us to this. <laughs> of course you've got quads. What else would you fucking have against me? When I have a full house, they gotta have quads. You had the dead. Yeah, I'm done. Fuck this game. Ends our session at Bellagio. I pack it in right after that took place. We ended up down a buy-in, all of which could have been avoided had we just given a little bit more thought and consideration to our opponent's range and the action that they're going to be taking with which part of their range. Fast forward a week later and we find ourselves at the win playing 1-3 No Limit. We look down at pocket kings under the gun and I raise this up to $15. Folds around to a player in middle position who puts in the $15 call. This player is an older gentleman, someone who we might affectionately refer to as an OMC in the poker community. Everyone else gets out of the way and we go heads up to a flop, which comes down very good for our exact hand. We see king, nine, deuce, all clubs. I start things off with a check here as I would with my entire range in this spot and the villain immediately bets $15. I put in the check raise and I bump things up to $50, really targeting all of the ace X hands he's gonna have in his range that contain a club, 
really want to get value from any of those draws or pair plus draws that he's got in his range. Now here's where things get really interesting. The opponent immediately three bets me to 115. As I mentioned, this player is an older gentleman, an old man coffee, if you will, and they do not three bet the flop lightly. He more than likely has got a pair plus a flush draw, or he just flopped the absolute stone cold nuts. Now, we can't just fold here because we do have odds to draw to a paired board and hit our full house. So I put in the call and we head off to a turn. Turn is no help to us. We see the queen of hearts doesn't change anything. And when I check, this player immediately fires out for another large bet of $100. Alarm bells are going off in my head here. Most certainly this player has flopped the nuts. I think we are drawing to a paired board in this spot 100% of the time. But again, I think our hand is just too strong to fold here. So I put in the call and we go to a river. Here is where things really go off the rails. The river is the jack of hearts and I go ahead and start things off with a check. This player immediately does the one chip all in. He seems very comfortable and very confident on this river. And I think this is just now a clear fold. We've got 300 left behind. He's got us covered. I just don't see any reason to invest more money in this spot against the player who was almost always only doing this with the stone cold nuts. I don't really think he takes this line with a hand like pocket nines or pocket deuces. Definitely doesn't do this with two pair. So I think we're just beat here and I think we're just gonna have to let our hand go. But I can't, I end up calling and we end up getting shown ace jack of clubs for the stone cold flop nuts and we lose $500 in a spot where I don't think we really had to lose our whole stack. Once again, we find ourselves in a situation where we end up paying off our opponent in a spot where I think they're only gonna be showing up with the stone cold nuts. If I had just given myself a little bit more time and put some thought into the player type, their exact range, how our hand stacks up against that range, I think we could have gotten away from it here on this river. I think a lot of players would just chalk this up to a cooler, but I don't really think it is, and I think that's a bit of a lazy way out to say that this was just a cooler. I think we have to look at who we're up against and give it some real thought and consideration here. If they're gonna be doing this with any type of hand that we beat, and if our hand is just a bluff catcher on this river. I think the answer is probably yes, and we probably could have just folded and saved ourselves $300. This one's a little bit more standard. I've got Jack Nine of Diamonds, we're in the cutoff, and we see a player in under the gun position limp in. Folds over to me, and I think Jack Nine of Diamonds here is gonna be a clear raise in position. I make it 15 to go. Player on the button puts in the $15 call, player in the small blind folds, and the player in the big blind puts in the call as well. Now it's back over to the player in the under the gun spot who pulls the old Phil Hellmuth limp raise move here and makes it 80 to go. Now we get to the point in this vlog where I have to ask the poker community here, the viewers, what are your thoughts on the limp raise move? Can we agree as a poker community that this move no longer works? Does anyone still fall for this? Everyone knows it's the nuts. I've never seen a player do this where it's not the nuts. I think we can all agree that the limp re-raise has seen its day, and its day is past. Let's go ahead and put it to rest. Leave your comments below and let me know what your thoughts are on the limp raise move. Now let's Hello? see if we can get a little redemption here with pocket eight since we butchered them the last time we played them. We're on the button this time. It folds around to the cutoff who makes it 15 to go. And I decided to just put in the $15 call. This invites in the small blind and the big blind. So we're gonna go four ways here to a flop. Flop comes down nine, four, six rainbow. Not a bad flop for pocket eights, all things considered. But we do have a lot of opponents here that we have to be cautious about. So when the small blind checks and the big blind checks and the original preflop razor checks, I decide to go ahead with a check here as well. This is the nine of spades, pairing the board, bringing in the trips for someone if they were slow playing a nine. Small blind starts with a check again, big blind checks, and the cutoff checks for a second time. So either someone has a slow played monster here or they pretty much have nothing. So I think we could be stabbing here on this turn, but 
I get passive and check, and we see the eight of hearts peel off on the river. This is the part of the vlog where it might become clear that I'm using this background music for dramatic effect and maybe a little comedic effect. And we find ourselves on the river with a full house where our passive play and our lack of thinking about what our opponents are really doing with their ranges bit us in the butt. I bet 35 when they all check and everyone snap folds and we get zero value with our rivered full house. This time we've got ace queen offsuit. We are in the hijack and we see a player in early ish position raise it up. He makes it 15 to go and a player directly to my right in the low jack puts in the call. I put in the call and I think I should be three betting here. But I don't, and that invites in the small blind, and the big blind gets out of the way. So we're going four ways here to a flop. Flop comes down pretty good, I would say. I would say as far as flops go, it's it's not a bad one. King, Jack, 10, Rainbow. Giving us the stone cold nutter butter. Small blind starts with a check, and now it's on the player who raised it up, who decides to put out a half pot size bet on this flop. He makes it 30 to go. Player directly to my right in the low jack surprisingly calls this $30 bet. She flicks in a $100 chip, but she just says call. Now it's on me, and I think we want to shovel in all the money now. I think we want a huge shovel like a dump truck to just shovel it all in there. But we got to start a little smaller, so I start with a $150 raise. I announce the $150, and I go ahead and put it here in the middle past the bet line. And now it's back over to the big blind who tanks for a little bit, but not too long. He lets his hand go pretty quickly here. And it's back over to the under the gun slash middle position razor. And I would expect he's probably going to have hit this somewhat hard. I mean, I think he can have a lot of hands that connect with this board. So I think we might get some action here, but unfortunately he folds pretty quickly. And now the action is back over to the player in the low jack who also decides to fold. And cue the sad music. All right, this is a fun one. Let's see what we can do here with King Jack of Spades. We're in the low jack once again. We see a limp from an under the gun player and it ends up folding around to the player directly to my right in the low jack who limps and I raise things up. I make it 20 to go. Player in the cutoff gets out of the way. The button gets out of the way. The player in the small blind gets out of the way and the player in the big blind gets out of the way. But the under the gun player who limped puts in the call and we're going three ways to a flop. Comes down 7-7-4 seven, seven, with two spades giving us two overs and a flush draw. Under the gun player starts things off by checking. Player in the low jack checks. And I get passive here and I check as well. Not a good idea. I think we should be betting here. We see the three of spades on the turn giving us the flush. And now the player in the under the gun seat decides to start betting. And he decides to start with a $35 bet here. Now it's on the low jack and she's thinking about it for a while here. She's in the tank for a little bit and it looks like she might be thinking about putting in the raise. So... We'll see what happens. I'm hoping she puts a little bit more money in the middle because we've got a pretty good hand. Even though it's a paired board, I still think we could get value from a lot of different combinations here. She does decide to let it go, so it's now on us, and I decide to put in the $35 call, and we are going to head off to a river. Let's see what the dealer's got for us on the river here. The dealer pulls the six of hearts here. The under-the-gun player makes some funny faces when he sees this card. And then he starts counting out chips while he's continuing to make some funny faces. And I'm not quite sure what to make of this. So he puts in a $50 bet and I think we've got a clear cut snap call. I don't think we want to raise here on a paired board and get coolered. So I just go ahead and put in the call and he instamucks and we take down this pot with our flush. We've got a monster. This time we've got ace king of diamonds. We are in middle position. Player to my right limps in for three and she's been limping in almost every single hand. So I raise to isolate here. I make it 20 to go and it folds around to her and she puts in the $20 call. So she'd been limp calling pretty much 
100% of hand, so I'm pretty happy to be getting in this spot with her. And I'm even more happy when we see a flop that comes down ace, ace, eight, rainbow. She checks it over to me and I fire out a continuation bet here for the same size, half pot size bet, $20. She pretty much instantly calls this $20 bet. So we're going off to a turn and we see the queen of spades peel off on the turn. She's only got about another $110 behind after this. So I decide to overbet here on this turn card and just jam it all in and she snap folds. Ay ay ay, cue the sad music. <laughs> This is going to be the last hand of the session, and can you think of a better hand to end a session with than pocket aces? I can't. We're in the low jack, and we see a player from the under the gun position limp in. It ends up folding over to me, and I raise this up, of course, because we have pocket aces. I make it 20 to go. Player who just sat down at the table in the cutoff puts in the $20 call. Button calls, and the player in the under the gun position limp calls. We go four ways to a flop, which comes down king, king, king. Pretty interesting board giving us a full house, but it's going to be hard for our opponents to have much here. So I check it around and we see the queen of spades peel off here on the turn. The under the gun player checks for a second time and I decide to start firing here. We can certainly get called by players that hit the queen on this turn, but I think it's probably better to just check. I think a lot of their range would want to start bluffing here on this turn card. So I don't know. I don't think betting accomplishes too much here besides maybe getting some value from queen X hands. We put in a $40 bet, the player in the cutoff thinks for a little bit here before deciding to put in the call. The button gets out of the way and the under the gun player gets out of the way as well. So we're going to go heads up here to a river and the river is the jack of diamonds. I think I can continue to bet for value here on this river. I think we're certainly going to get called if he's got a queen or if he's got a jack. I think we could also get called by some non-believing pairs like pocket tens or pocket nines. So I fire out for $65 and this puts the cutoff into the tank for a little bit here. He doesn't think too long before announcing a raise. And it's not exactly a small raise. He decides to bump it up to $225. All I have to think, is he raising here with a pair of queens or a pair of jacks that have a full house for value on this river? I think the answer is probably no. I think we're just beat. I end up letting it go. Cue the sad music. All right, it is about 10.30 here at night, Saturday night, just leaving the win right now. Just played a session. 1-3, no limit, Texas Hold'em, and it did not go well, unfortunately. Um, winning is not a thing right now in my world. Right now we are in losing mode. Cannot book a win. Um, I've been on a very significant downswing. I played three, two or three sessions at Bellagio, lost all three sessions. Played a session last night at Resorts World, lost in that session. Played tonight here at the win, lost at this session. So, yeah, right now it is a, it's a tough one. It's a tough grind. And when they say the downswings are significant, they are not lying. They are significant and they are brutal. It is very hard to keep your head in the game when you are not winning. So, yeah, we were in the game for, shit, what were we in the game for tonight? $1,200? And we cashed out for 532 for a loss of $672. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a buy-in. You know, a $500 buy-in at the win. So a little more than a buy-in, but not the ideal outcome. Not the outcome that we're looking for. At one point, I did grind my way back up where I was only down like 200 bucks. And then the pocket aces hand happened and some other hands just, you know, the money just like disappears. So, um, yeah, I'm studying a lot. I'm working really hard away uh, from the table on my game. I've been trying to eat super healthy. I've been trying to exercise more and just be mentally strong. And hopefully this is going to turn around. Um, it has to. It has to turn around. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, something's going to have to give. 
Um, so that's that's where I'm at right now. But I did. Ho- I hope you guys. I know it's a little bit of a bummer of an outro, but I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, if you did, please do consider hitting the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. It does make me feel a lot better when you guys subscribe. Um, I know like 90% of the people who watch these videos don't hit that subscribe button, which I don't understand. It's free. Just just hit the subscribe button, guys. Come on, you could do it. Gamble on me. Gamble on me. So. I'm going to regroup and uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. And hopefully it will be a much, uh, much more cheerful episode the next time around. So see you guys soon. Take care.